The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we are broadcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. Today is CAN Day. I have CAN written on my hand and you guys are already starting to send your pictures in of different groups that you're a part of with CAN written somewhere on your hand. Of course, CAN start, stands for Coverage for Autism Now. We're really excited about this day and hopefully we're going to have a bunch of pictures to send to some of our legislators a little bit later on today. So take a picture, write can somewhere on yourself and your child. You can put it on a shirt, on a hat. Uh, you can write it on your hand. Nancy and I are going to be creative with it a little bit later on, but <laughs> whatever, wherever you decide to put it, uh, stand in solidarity with us for those families who do not yet have access to autism insurance coverage. Really important that we start to level this playing field. So it's Wednesday, and Wednesday is always exciting here. We have Dr. Doreen Grampache with us, and in just a few minutes, we'll start Ask Dr. Doreen you'll have a wonderful opportunity to speak to her in real time. Let's talk to you about how you can be in touch with the show and get your questions to the forefront. Emily's going to show you lots of different ways that you can participate, different ways that you can watch the show. I'll remind you that our homepage is autism-live.com. When you go there, make sure that you check out the blog. And also, there's a computer screen there. If you click on the little triangle that's on the computer screen, you can be watching the live show or the most recently recorded show. Now to the side of that, there are a couple of white boxes there. The top one is the question that we're currently answering. And then below that is a bigger white box that has your questions in it. They're just waiting for you. Put your cursor there, start typing, hit enter, and it will show up here on my screen. And in that way, you and I can be having a conversation almost in real time. But even more importantly, you can be talking to the experts that we have. And today, there is no finer expert than Dr. Doreen Grampache in the field of autism. So it's it's time for Ask Dr. Doreen. Dr. Doreen Grandpiche is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grandpiche. Dr. Grandpiche. Dr. Doreen Grandpiche. Dr. Doreen Grandpiche is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. We're so thrilled to have Dr. Doreen Grampache here with Good us. Morning. Good morning. You look so pretty in your yellow. You look all springy. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm like super, super tired today. I've been working wow. already very early this morning. So well, it's lovely to be here. We know the kind of schedule you keep is, is amazing, that you still have time for us. So we appreciate you being here. It's, it's always fun to be here. I enjoy it. Well, Here's a, my can. There, See there? <laughs> She's got can on her hand as well. Uh, we hope that all of you are going to participate with us today in in the CAN campaign, coverage for autism now. Dr. Grampache, as you know if you watch the show, is a wonderful expert in the field of autism. And as I always like to tell her, she's a visionary in the field of autism. Thank you, Shannon. She's a wonderful resource of information for us, whether we're parents, teachers, practitioners, or individuals who are on the spectrum, to ask someone who has just extensive experience in the field of autism and has been able to help so many individuals with autism to reach 
progress that's meaningful to them. Right. So we're, we're so thrilled to have her here to be answering our questions, but we do remind you at the start of the show that no one on the show, there is no expert that could possibly give you individual specific advice on in this format. That's right. It just would be a disservice to say that uh, that, that could happen. Right. Um, but still, you're able to give us direction and focus so that we can figure out what the next step is a, a lot of the time, which we is really helpful. We hope so. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and well, we've had people writing back and, and telling us how important it is, how, how important this hour is in their lives. I'm glad so, to hear that. That's great. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing to, I, I get to have a front row seat and I'm very privileged to have a front row seat to hear you answer these questions. Thank you. I'm glad we're helping some folks. I am glad too. And that, that brings me, I want to get right into some questions. Sure. Uh, Okay, so uh, this first one. Hi, Shannon and Dr. Doreen. Thank you so much for a great show. I'm a parent of a nine-year-old girl who was diagnosed with autism when she was three. Mm -hmm. I'm currently doing my master's in applied behavior mm -hmm. analysis. Rock that. Uh, I want to ask you if it will be possible to accrue experience hours working with my daughter and under the supervision of a BCBA. Your feedback will be uh, greatly appreciated. We're having more and more parents writing in and saying, if I'm I'm going to spend the time to learn everything that I need to learn to help my child. I want it to count for more than that, as if that's not enough, because it is. But I want to be useful to other families, and I want to have a career in this field. They right. sometimes they want to do that. Uh, the registered behavior uh, technician. Sometimes they want to become a BCBA. So right. here's a great question: Can we? You have to get a bunch of hours mm -hmm. to be a BCBA. Can mm -hmm. you do it working with your own child? Yeah, as far as I know, you can. Um, you would think, I mean, I think if it was, you know, I, I went through psychology licensure before the BCBA and it's so much more strict mm -hmm. um, in regards to things like this. This would be considered uh, in psychology a conflict of interest, but in, in as far as the BACB, the Behavior Analysis Certification Board is concerned, I don't think they mind that you uh, receive hours working with your own child. Um, I'm pretty sure that's true, but if you, this to be able to accurately answer this parent's questions, I would suggest that you uh, contact IBT, Institute for Behavioral Training, our training organization, and they, uh, Cecilia knows all these things because they're constantly training people and mentoring. Um, so, you know, at CARD we have a whole mentorship program for our own staff, and so um, and, and for outside people as well. I mean, we can provide the mentorship and supervision. And I, I'm pretty sure that you're allowed to use your own child as well for this. And it would, if, of, of course, it's great because you gain a lot of uh, insight and experience. It's a little bit harder, I think, because we all are emotionally much more involved with our own kids. But I think that uh, it's fine to do. I, I'm saying this because just a few weeks ago, I think on this show, we were talking about the RBT for parents. Mm -hmm. And I did take that idea back upstairs and uh, presented it, and now we're going to be putting together a training for RBT for all parents. So that'll be love kind it. of cool. Yeah, absolutely love that. That's so exciting to me. And I, I had said this uh, probably a year ago for some parents who were interested in being BCBAs as well. And it's a, it's something like fifteen hundred hours that you have to, isn't it? It's like a crazy, BCBA is, yes, yeah, crazy number of hours that you have to get to get the BCBA. Right. And um, and and I was saying at some point we're going to see parents who are going to start uh, switching. So if, uh, because at a certain point, I would imagine it's great to have somebody else working with your child. So I can see two moms saying, I'll work with your child if you work oh, with my child. that's a great idea, yeah. And, and in that way, you get all your hours, your child gets, you know, all, all those hours really could be incredible. That's a very good idea. I love it when parents get excited about doing these things. I know, it's amazing. We actually have a number of parents who have gone through it with their own child and then have gone and, I mean, it is a pretty major thing. Get gotten their master's degree and their board certification, and which you know involves not just the 1,500 hours, but uh, examination yeah. and so on, and, and ongoing continuing it. And they are fabulous providers. Yeah. Um, you know, Thea Davis is one of them, for yeah. instance. She's an amazing provider. Yeah, remarkable. So, mm -hmm. Really incredible and, and exciting to me because Nancy Allspa Jackson, who's going to be with us in the next hour for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy, we 
always talk about as parents that, you know, there is a grief that comes when your child is diagnosed with autism. Right. But for a lot of us, Nancy calls it the kitchen floor club, that at some point you're on the kitchen floor and saying, I don't know what to do. And that you, you know, pray to whatever the God of your understanding or whatever the universe, whatever you believe in and say, help me to help my child. And then I will help whoever I can. Right. right. And that a lot of people find a, a second calling and in different ways, right. in different ways in the aut in the field of autism. So here is a great way to That's find amazing. that second Absolutely. calling. It's useful to your child and useful to so many, and it's a new career for you. And it's productive, and I think it's important when we get scared or anxious and depressed and fearful of life that we actually start doing something productive um, that helps other people because it's very it, it takes you away from your own uh, problems. I couldn't agree more. I said to a friend on this morning, this morning, she said to me, I'm just feeling bummed and I just want somebody to talk to. Have you got a minute? I said, oh, I would love nothing better than to listen to what you have going on because nothing could take me further away from what's on my mind. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and I said, please share with me. Yeah. Uh, love it. Okay. We've had some questions about chromosome 16 duplication. Mm -hmm. uh, two different questions. If you have chromosome, chromosome 16 duplication, does that mean you have autism? And a second one, what does duplication Duplication of chromosome 16 mean. Mm -hmm. it's funny that we would have separate questions. Yes. On this, but so you know, <clears throat> all of the any kind of duplication of a chromosome is essential. So the chromosomes, I don't know how far into detail I should go, but it's this is we're talking about our genetic DNA essentially, and and. Um, when you have duplication on a chromosome, it will generally lead to developmental disability of some type. Um, the answer to the first question, no, autism is not yet uh, defined in a uh, objective way like that. Uh, it would be good if it was. It's not. It's defined in a very subjective way. It's uh, based on a series of symptoms. Um, that present themselves behaviorally. So if for, it's very possible, it's entirely possible that some of the kids who have a diagnosis of autism based on their symptoms uh, could potentially also have duplication of chromosome 16 or duplication of some other cro chromosome because any duplication will generally has a higher probability of leading to some delays. Okay. Um, and those delays could potentially look like autism. We just don't know. But you so, don't necessarily have autism not if you at all. have a duplication. Absolutely. Of, uh, right. okay. Not okay. at all. So there's many other uh, disorders that are not autism that are due to some duplication of a chromosome. Um, it would be, I've always thought about this and I've always wondered why are we not, like, you know, of course this was part of the Agre uh, cause as well, which was the genetic research that mm. is currently underway as well, always. And that's what we're, what they're trying to do, Autism Speaks now owns Agre, and what they're trying to do is, of course, uh, gather as much genetic information as possible because there's, it's very likely that the overall spectrum of autism has, you know, we believe it has multiple phenotypes. Yeah. Some of those phenotypes could be defined genetically. Yeah. So it's possible that if, you know, we should be really looking at every child and getting their genetic composition as well. We really, really should. Yeah. yeah. And um, that would then allow us to see what percentage of kids with the diagnosis of autism uh, have, you know, pure, let's say, chromosome 16 duplication yeah. or some other duplication or some other chromosomal issue. But it does not necessitate that if you have chromosome 16 duplication that you would have autism. Um, again, with any kind of duplication, there's a higher likelihood that you will have some delays, but not necessarily the case. Okay, great answer uh, to a very complicated subject, but uh, thank you for asking, uh, for both people who are asking those questions. We're going to take a short break, and then when we come back, we've got some more questions for Dr. Doreen Grampache, and you can be writing your questions in right now on the live feature. Stick with us. Hi, I'm Lisa Ackerman. Welcome back to Talk of Facts, where you get to ask the questions, and we help lead you to the common answers and available for your autism journey. A most common question we get is why are some of the treatments uh, used in the medical world not covered for autism? 
My answer to you, and it may shock you, is they are covered. The stopgap between payment and non-payment is how you code your insurance bills. Now, there are some standards uh, in American Academy of Pediatric Standards of Care for autism that are covered. Those are available on the Taka Now website, takanow.org. But what you find often, and this has been proven in multiple studies, that children with autism not just suffer with or have issues with that label, they also have a lot of other medical issues that tend to come with autism. So as a parent, you need to know we have a complete white paper on all of the things I'm going to describe to you that's free. It talks about the most common comorbid conditions that comes with autism. So comorbid, just think of it as comes with. So at the TACA website, we give you all of the codes in our health insurance tips, reimbursement tips document um, that will help you code and get the maximum reimbursement from your health insurance company. So no, autism is treatable. And yes, health insurance do pay for that treatment. So. Hopefully the, that tip helped. Um, we'll see you back next time for the next Talk of Fact. Welcome back to Autism Live. Doreen, Dr. Doreen Grandpache is here with us. She is an amazing expert in the field of autism. This Thank is a, 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 just a wonderful treat to have her here answering all of our questions. Moving on to the next question. Good morning. How do I start teaching my five-year-old beginning conversation skills? Right now, he's just echoing me when I ask, how are you? And thanks for your help. Oh, um, it's a pleasure. We're glad to help. Um, I, it's too complex a, a, a question for me to just tell you specifically how to go from one step to another because, you know, really, um, there's just beginning conversation and it's, it's, people always ask me these questions and I tell them there's about, I don't know, maybe 50 things you have to teach in order for conversation to occur. So um, I'll just go through a quick sort of some of the things okay. that you teach. You know, when, when you start with a child, obviously you're just teaching a um, series of labels. And then when, after you've figured out labels, just, you know, nouns, then you have to teach verbs, actions, and then you have to teach past tense and future tense. And uh, meanwhile, you know, all of this has to be integrated. Um, and then you have to, so you're building sentences as well. Mm -hmm. And then you have to, of course, teach uh, adjectives, you know, descriptors, and bring those into the sta statements as well. And then you have to teach uh, pronouns, and you have to teach prepositions. And when I say adjectives or descriptors, you know, there's a million different descriptors, obviously. And then, um, once you have all the basic structure of language or speech in place, uh, then you have to teach peripheral things such as taking turns. Yeah. So these are each individual uh, thing that I'm mentioning is a lesson in skills. Um, and then you have to, of course, uh, teach exchange, so dialogue, so questions and how you can answer questions, uh, how your intonation changes with questions versus statements, um, taking turns with another person versus a, in a group, um, and then, you know, being able to actually listen to the information of the person that's talking to you and then modify your content, so that's more working memory type stuff. And then, of course, you have to do all the things that go into actual conversation. So how do I join the conversation of two other people versus a group of people? How do I repair a conversation, let's say, if, uh, which then brings in the whole concept of how do I read their uh, facial expressions and body language to tell whether they're interested or losing interest? And if they are losing interest and walking away, how do I repair it now? Um, then it brings in also self-monitoring. So have I been talking about the same subject for a long time or have I been going on too long about this? Um, and then, so there's repair, um, you know, exchange, initiation, ending appropriately, um, conversing with in the appropriate setting. So, you know, uh, you change, you tend to change your 
conversation completely when it's a social setting versus a more like academic setting or formal setting. Uh, there's a billion things, yeah. right? I mean, I just mentioned a few. And it all sounds and that's overwhelming. My, and that's my tired brain. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if you realize that a lot goes into conversation, um, social conversation, and then not to mention content, right? Oh, so like yeah. knowing the appropriate social yeah. content. So you, should, you then realize that you just, you do need a much more comprehensive and detailed curriculum. Yeah. And that's why we developed skills. And so for this parent, my suggestion would be really to go on skillsforautism.com, skillsforautism.com, and that's where you're gonna find this information. Um, conversation itself as a lesson, I believe, is in the, I'm thinking it's in the social curriculum. It could be in the language curriculum. I don't remember now. But, I think uh, there are parts of it in each. Maybe there's parts in yeah. each. But what you need to do is start, do it right. Don't just select little things here and there. Um, you know, this is what often happens, I think, with other providers, is that they will just select a concept and teach it to the child and assume that the child will now get everything else. And it's not enough to just teach a child to memorize a conversation. That's not the point. The point is you have to teach the child everything they know in order to bring it together. Yeah. So really, if you answer the questions in skills, the um, assessment or the index, you'll see everything your child needs to learn, everything. And then you go uh, just through the program and, and the skills will tell you when, when you should enter when various things become, your child becomes eligible. So we won't let you teach things that are too early, too young, that sort of thing. And then you bring it together that way and you produce uh, you know, enough of a repertoire of basic skills that your child can actually engage in conversation. And I have to say, from a parent who watched my child go through this, I had Card in my home working through exactly those lessons, the same exact thing that's in skills that right. you have access to. And and I remember standing on the sidelines and watching on the video baby monitor and thinking, what are we doing? Right. I want my child to be speaking, right. and I want him to be able to converse, and they were teaching him, you know, uh, they, we had flashcards, and they were, you know, this is a bird. A bird is an animal and they were teaching the bird has wings all these different things and I kept thinking when is it all gonna gel when right. is it all gonna come together right. and on the day that I saw it gel and come together it was like the heavens opened up and I could hear the angels sing <laughs> but it was a good and he flew through those lessons it was a good I want to say six to seven months to get through all that foundation absolutely and it required so much patience on my part and I had to monitor who I let be in my head during that time. Mm -hmm. My mother came and visited and she was like, honey, I think this is a waste of time. And I said, I assure you it's not. Right. Right? But I didn't know for sure. I know. And I then know. I saw it and I knew for sure. I know. You're so right. This is such a valid point. I was just talking to one of our dear friends in mm -hmm. South Africa and she was saying the same thing. It's so hard for parents, I think, because you just want it to happen yesterday. Yes. And it's And there is a ton of repetition that goes into ABA and not only that there's you know I just I literally just named maybe 15 20 programs and that's just kind of what came out of my head right and there's four or five hundred programs so it's not it's you take six months to teach five different things and then you bring them into one then you take another six months to teach ten other things and you bring them into one and then join them with the first one and it's a continuous building process like that. So it's very hard for parents. I totally get it. But it's important to know that that's the path. If you where you want to get is to the conversation, you have to follow the path. And when, as a parent, I want to take shortcuts. Right. Shortcuts don't get you there. They don't. And if you think about this, you know, we're trying to do what God did with us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it that way, but I often think of this. It's like one of the things we teach very early on is matching. A lot of people say, why do you do matching? Like, what's the purpose of matching? And if you think about it, matching is a very interesting skill because first what you're doing is just, I mean, there's many different components to why we teach matching, uh, aside from the fact that it's the most basic of compliance skills. So just please do what I'm asking you to do. Mm -hmm. But then it's, it's a, um, you start with identical matching, which then also allows me to see if the child is seeing things the same way we are and hearing things. And mm -hmm. that brings in the whole concept of 
uh, you know, receiving information auditorily and then producing it mm -hmm. visually. So that's an important skill that your child has to have. But once they've done identical matching and then we go to like similar matching and then if eventually categories and sorting, the whole concept of categories and sorting is extremely important because that's where you start to develop organization in your brain, in your mind. So if I taught you, let's say, a thousand labels and I didn't categorize them somehow, you'd have a very, very hard time retrieving information going forward. But the fact that I categorize things, and so, you know, let's say I'll teach you that this is a, a pad of paper, but I will also categorize this pad of paper in a number of different ways. I'll categorize it as, as a yellow object. Mm -hmm. I'll categorize it as uh, something that's rectangular, mm -hmm. something that's made of paper, for mm -hmm. instance, right? Or something that you can write on. And those are all different lessons that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So that in the future, if I ask, name some things that are rectangular, right. this actually will come to mind because it was taught that way. Right. Or if I say name a few things that are yellow, it might come to, to mind. So the categorization of stuff then becomes extremely important in future retrieval. And that everything is like that, Shannon. So everything we teach, we teach in multiple ways because we want the child to be able to retrieve it later on. Yeah. That's why it takes so long. And, but it's amazing and it's worthwhile. And I see that, I, I see the paycheck for that every day with my child and the things that he understands and the things that he gets and the way right. that I'm able to converse with him. I always say in the beginning when he was diagnosed, I wanted to know if I was ever going to be able to, I'm going to cry, but I wanted to know if I was going to be able to have a conversation with him about the big stuff, right. about concepts. Right. And, you know, why are we here on this planet? Right. Was that ever going to, and we have those conversations now and yeah. I know that we we do because we took the time to do all this to do all of those course, steps and to do it right you also have a very deep child who now also analyzes you <laughs> yes. which I love. and thank goodness for that because heaven knows i need some analysis <laughs> right um yeah he's remarkable but uh you know i those were the things we wanted and, and we followed the steps so we encourage you uh check out skills take a look yeah, uh, that'll help the most and by the way you can have your aba provider use skills with your child there absolutely are, there are lots of aba providers that are not card that are using skills oh yeah so if you have a good aba provider and and you are like working with them, but you see that there are some things that you're missing, ask them to use skills with your child. The curriculum is all there for you. Um, we've told you before that you can get a 14-day free trial trial mm -hmm. for skills. Go to skillsforautism.com. Um, there are two different ways that you can do that, one with a credit card, one without, that you can still do a 14-day free trial. You don't get access to everything, but you get access to enough that you really get a feel for what it is. Now, somebody had written in to us last week and said, we talk about skills and, and how great it is. They want to know if there is a cost. Yes, after that 14 days, there is a cost. It depends on how many children you register, what it costs. But I also also want you to know that there are potential grants that are available for skills. You can register for those at ACT Today. That's act-today.org. They have given away scholarships for skills. So if it's a thing where you cannot afford it, it's very cost effective. Uh, let's start out by saying that. But if it is beyond your means right now, don't let that stop you. Apply for a grant from ACT Today. I, I heard from Nancy they love to give grants for skills because they know that people are going to use it. Right. And I, I, I'm not even sure right now what the rate is, but I think if you're an individual user, it's $75 a month, mm -hmm. which really, if you think about it, you know, it comes to about $900 a year. Mm -hmm. And you would be shocked at what you get for $900 a year. Oh. I mean, it would, it's so complex. There's so many things in there. Not only is there an assessment tool, there's a massive curriculum in every possible lesson you'd ever want to teach your child. Um, IEP goals, uh, treatment tracking, it allows you to track your medications and your diets with ABA together. Um, there's a BIP builder that helps you build a behavior intervention plan. There's a functional assessment on, I mean, there is everything you possibly, and I really recommend you get on there now because we're just about to add materials as well so that you can download and print your own stimulus cards. And there's a lot of stuff that's very, very useful. And, and another thing is that you can also ask your funding agency to fund it. I mean, we had 
you know, Magellan, I will say, a fabulous uh, managed healthcare company, uh, purchased 5,000 licenses for all of their providers oh. so that they have a lot of families receiving this now. Wonderful. So this is what I'm saying is, you know, we, if you push it, I think that it, your funding agency will be interested in purchasing it. It allows the funding agencies to have, and of course for them it's even cheaper because they buy in bulk. Right. But f the main thing for them is that it allows them to actually see the child's progress and to um, help on in term the provider then is going down a route that's very valid. Absolutely. And and we should mention too there are some schools who are using it too. You oh, can we check have with a your lot child's of school, school districts, yeah. And it may be that your child's school is participating. There might even be a skills account associated with your child. You can ask them if there already is. Right. Um, and uh, really remarkable. I can tell you that if you're going to an IEP and you want to hire an advocate to look at your IEP and to go with you to recommend goals, it's going to cost you $900 for that one meeting. Right. And you can get all of that from skills. Right. So it's it's truly truly amazing. All right, let's take another short break, and then we're going to come back with some questions uh, uh, that kind of go hand in hand with what we talked about, because sometimes as a parent, you get frustrated with what's happening, where are we, where we're going to get to, and we have a question about that. But first, let's take a break, and we'll be right back. Hello, fellow activists. Last segment, we talked about step three, get support. Step number four is don't compare, run your own race. Now, it's one thing to aspire to be like someone that's really helped their child. We all want to do that. That's really different than keeping up with the Joneses. That only serves to make you envious and full of regret. There will always be someone who has a child with autism who is doing better than yours and there will always be someone who has a child with autism who's doing worse than yours. One morning I was talking to the mom of a recovered child who told me he had been moved into the gifted class. Well, I had heard that week that my own son, who was in fifth grade, was reading at first grade level. Now, I have to admit, I was kind of proud of him until that phone call, which put me over the edge. The green-eyed monster of jealousy. Well, later that same day, I got into the elevator as I was taking my son to clinic. There was a father with his two sons, one typical and one with severe autism. He was pretty much nonverbal, but he did make some very strange sounds over and over again. He had bite marks, scratches all over his arms. He wore mittens to protect him from himself. The father, however, had a big smile on his face. Needless to say, the universe was sending me a message that day. Don't compare. Be grateful for the progress your child has made and will continue to make. So until next time, keep running your own race at your own pace. Don't forget to stop for water and keep the faith. Welcome back to Autism Live and to Ask Dr. Doreen. We have with us Dr. Doreen Grampache and she's answering our questions and it's a wonderful thing. Okay. So thrilled to have you here. I want to push on with some more questions. Sure. We've got a question. My son is three and a half. He started with cards six months ago, 40 hours. We started potty training him in November and five and a half months later, he's still not potty trained. His schedule at the card center is every one and a half hours, no accidents, but no manding. His schedule at home is every hour and again, no manding. He is on a really strict diet. We tried food reinforcement and now we have switched to the iPad. I have cut him off the iPad completely unless he goes potty as his reward. I know this is not normal. Five and a half months is too long. He is verbal and smart, but I don't know what the heck is going on. And she wrote, please, with like five E's, help. Right. I'm not able to figure out exactly what's going on because I can't, from the email, because I can't tell if you are, if I'm, uh, okay, so <laughs> Jay, I have lots of questions. I can't tell okay. if the iPad's being used for manding or it's just being used for reinforcer or it's being used for both, which shouldn't be the case. Um, I can't tell if he's already mastered it on a schedule. Why is there a different schedule at home than there is at, at, at the center? And I can't figure out why we are going for manning already unless he's completely fluent with the schedule. So I'd have a lot of questions. So here's what I suggest that we do. Um, I don't know what office you're in, but I would ask you to 
um, write to your supervisor and say that you had some communication with me. And whenever we have an issue like this, we have a system in place where, um, so we have several senior people uh, who, whose job it is to oversee all of the cases to make sure that everybody's doing everything wrong, right, so we catch things like this. Um, so our ARG group, our Autism Research Group, which is um, PhDs in autism who in ABA who are fabulous, fabulous, like Johnson Tarbox, who yeah. you've had on this show, um, have somehow automatically turned into our um, toilet training experts. <laughs> I feel bad for them. They've published on this numerous times, obviously, but I think that it's they were telling me that a lot of supervisors who have issues with party training turn to them. Yeah. So all you have to do is you have to tell your supervisor, see every case, every single child at card, we automatically will take a couple of hours uh, of your child's funding and give it to a senior supervisor, someone who is, um, you know, higher level trained, PhD level trained, has been at CARD for a very long time and has seen hundreds of kids. Rock stars. Rock stars. <laughs> and so all you have to do is um, you have to tell your supervisor, feel free at any time uh, to CC me on the email, by the way. My email is Doreen at centerforautism.com. I love to hear from our parents. Um, just put, email your supervisor and say, I talked to Doreen and what we want, we need some guidance on the potty training protocol. Um, and could you please use senior, corporate hours? That's what it's called, corporate mm -hmm. hours um, with ARG or whoever, QA, one of our senior groups um, to make sure we're doing everything fine with the toilet training. And that's all. And then somebody who's um, a rock star, as Shannon said, will um, oversee the case and make sure you get through the potty training. Don't worry about five and a half months, that's not a big deal. Your child just started six months ago. It's unusual that we would start potty training within the first month of compliance. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's not a big deal. We will get through it. And I appreciate you saying that because that's the thing that I was thinking sitting at this point um, in my life with my child, if I could do one thing over again, I would go back and stop worrying. <sighs> Mm, yeah, don't I would worry. just have a worryectomy. Yeah, I would pull it out and say, "I'm I'm on this ride, right. and I'm going to do this to the fullest, and I'm and I'm going to commit to this, and I'm going to let the worry be someplace else. Absolutely, give it to me. Give it to the you know the teddy bear in the corner. Right. Give the worry to somebody else because here's the one thing that I know for you: your child is going to be potty trained. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's going to be next week or next month right. or, or further right. down the road, but it's going to happen. Right, and you worrying about it won't help it happen faster. That's true. I mean, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you're saying that, Shannon, because I have had some children who are just severely affected by autism mm -hmm. and we get them through potty training. Yep. So, you know, there's no use in worrying about it. Just keep with it. It'll and, happen. And you're my kind of mom because I used to say that worry was not just my uh, part-time habit. It was my full-time job. Yeah. I still participate yeah. in it and I need somebody to tell me, stop worrying. Absolutely. I mean, how uh, can you stop worrying? It's, it's our kids. Right. right. Uh, you know, and for some, from time to time, I will sing the little Doris Day, que sera, sera yeah. song and remind myself, you know, nothing bad is happening right now because if anything bad were happening right now, I wouldn't have time to talk to you about That's it. That's true. Right? So, Nothing bad is happening right now. You're just on the ride. And there That's will right. come a day when you will write and say, my child is potty trained. And then you'll be on to the next thing. Right. You will. There will be another thing. That's such uh, a good way to put it, really, yeah. So take a breath yeah. and have that faith and have that trust that it is going to happen. You're going to take action, though, to make sure that it happens in the most timely fashion right. that you can, as Dr. Grandpache shared. Uh, and But it will be okay. Yes. And when it and it is one of those great things that when once you have potty trained your child, uh, then it, it I do think it's one of the biggest milestones for our parents. I know it is, and we don't realize it, but it Jeez. is. It's so difficult. I know, and once your life the, changes. It really does. It really does, and. It's not even, I mean, I, I don't know what this parent has experienced or what you experienced, but I have to tell you, some of the cases that I've worked with, I mean, it is, you know, it wasn't just the, the child not being potty trained, but the, the child was feces smearing oh, yeah. and, um, you know, uh, on purpose uh, having potty accidents to get attention. And 
all sorts of stuff. And I think it is really life changing for parents when, when this is under control. Oh, I, you know, everybody has gone through it at some point, that potty training with every child on the spectrum, not right. on the, I, I, the thing that I remember, I have a friend who has three boys and uh, her middle, my son is just between her youngest and her middle one. And I remember being in the parking lot of a McDonald's mm -hmm. and we had three children who had had accidents. And we were in the parking lot with the back of her van open, wiping up all manner of, of things, Crazy. right? With, with 13 changes changes of clothes between her car and my car. And and when we were past that phase and no longer had to do that, the freedom with which you move about the cabin is crazy good. Absolutely. You're not you're not packing things, you're not there's not the worry, you get to go be someplace, play with other kids and not have right. to worry about it. It will happen. Yes. It will happen. <laughs> uh, you have it coming to you. We've ordered it. Uh, so, but uh, follow up and then and then sit back and be patient. Okay. Uh, also want to know people talk about one to one aid at school. Are those hours counted within the forty hours of ABA or separate from the forty hours? They're counted um, as part of, uh, but as long as they're good. So. You know, it's uh, if it's a card program, we would be doing a lot of the hours at home initially, um, and then once uh, the child is school age and we basically have no other option but to go into school, we will go into school. Um, and so the team is all one. So I have my own people in school who are being shadows and then being, uh, after a while, unknown shadows for the child. But And then, yes, it counts. Because if you think about it, the child's uh, time in school increases, right? So when we first integrate into school, we're just doing something probably like three days a week, three hours each day, nine hours, and that's that. Uh, but by the time they're in, let's say, kindergarten or first grade, we're generally up to about 25 hours at least, or 30 even. And so what I will t tend to do and hope to do is that by the time the child's in first grade, I don't think they need me, my aid there the whole time, uh, but they probably do need the aid there 15 to 20 hours. And so about 15 to 20 hours of the program is at school and the rest is at home, adding up to about 40 hours. Um, and. Every child is different, so every there need you could have a child who needs more support in school, less at home, or the other way around. But the home aspect generally keeps going because that's where we're actually doing the teaching, mm -hmm. and the school aspect is where we're doing a lot of the generalization and teaching the child to and use those skills with their peers. So yes, it does. But then when when schools offer an aid. I don't really like to count it in the 40 hours unless the aide is very well trained, so trained by your agency and attends all the meetings, all the clinics, really knows what they're doing. Um, otherwise, you know, having someone stand there and just uh, make sure the child doesn't get into trouble, that's not counted. Yeah. Okay, really important. All right, we're going to take one last break and come back with Dr. Doreen Grampuche. Stick with us. What is autism? 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 Uh, <laughs> I've been asking myself that for a very, very long time. Um, let me think about that one. <laughs> trying to, uh, just, uh... Um... Jeez, let me think. <laughs> Oh man, that's a tough one. Yes. Uh, autism. Uh, uh... Autism is a neurological disorder that affects many of our kids in different ways. It's a learning disability that affects the cognitive functions of the brain. A lot of people have the misconception that it's a disability, and it's really not. I look at it as like a special gift. When one person thinks differently from another, it's an opportunity for everyone to learn to understand someone that's a little different than them. Autism is the ability to educate. They're given. So much talent in different areas. To me, autism means a chance to be with and be around people you really care about. Autism is beautiful. It's a way of seeing the world differently. It's always unique, totally intelligent, and sometimes mysterious. Happiness that, that, that comes out of my um, son's um, hard work. It's a movement. Unpredictable. That's right. right. Awesome. Love. The field I want to work in. Laughter. Fun. Joy. Autism is beautiful to me. I want you to remember these three words. There is hope.
Welcome back to Autism Live and to Ask Dr. Doreen. We have Dr. Doreen Grampache here with us and she's answering your questions. Okay, we had a question that I don't fully understand, but part of it I do understand. A viewer wrote in and said, do you have any information on, it says BLK water. I don't know what that is. And if it helps children with ASD, if so, in what way does it help? I don't I don't know what that is, but we'll, we'll do some research on that. But the second part of her question, do you have any information on whether or not sign language helps to increase a child's ability to communicate and ultimately speak? My son doesn't have verbal language. However, he uses PECs and different forms of expressive language. And then she's given us an email. That's, that's how I know that it's a uh, she. Uh, and she said, thank you for your help. Uh, and we will email the link to what Dr. Grampache has to say. So the question is uh, whether or not sign language helps to increase a child's ability to communicate and ultimately speak. And her son does not have verbal language, but he does use PECs and different forms of expressive language. Right. And also with the BLK water, I guess it's the water that has some deal going with generation rescue right oh. now. It's alkalized water, okay. but I don't know enough about it okay. at all. Alkalized water generally increases hydration more than regular water, but that's all I know. Okay. Um, sign language, of course, is a form of communication. It's a little bit harder than, than PEX. Um, you know, when you take a, an exam, for example, a fi final exam of some sort, and you have recall questions where you have to generate all the, th every, the answer out of your head mm -hmm. versus multiple choice questions mm -hmm. where you have some choices and you pick one. And multiple choice is much easier because it's visually in front of you and you, it, it uh, helps you remember right. versus recall. Um, and that's the difference between PECS and, and sign language. Sign language is something you have to recall, um, all the shapes and so on, because it's not right in front of you. But uh, PECS is in front of you, and it's a reminder, so it's a lot easier to grasp. Okay. So um, that's one aspect of it. Uh, generally speaking, I, I would say if your child's already doing PECS, stay with PECS. Okay. Definitely stay with it, because you have a ton of options with PECS. You will go to, uh, from the PECS program, you can actually start to, uh, pay, you know, the child will start to see icons, obviously, that it represent things. And then the icon, we generally pair the icons with words mm -hmm. under them. And before you know it, your child has memorized the look of those words. And before you know it, then your child can actually start uh, using an iconic system on a on an iPad, yeah, and they can actually start to learn to type words, and that's a really good uh, way of communicating, much yeah. better than sign language. Sign language, you have to realize the receiver has to understand sign yeah. as well, so you're limiting your child's communication abilities. Pex is in my mind much better. Okay, um, good job, Andy Bondi, many years ago, fabulous thing that he did. So. Um, in any case, I think that you should stay with that and you should pursue that because, and that's another thing, people don't realize how far you can actually go with a iconic system. You really can. So make sure you know someone, you, you have someone helping you who's familiar with all the different levels of pecs. I have to say that when I started doing this show, I hadn't been exposed to a lot of older adults on the spectrum who were using assistive technology. Right. And now I go to events and it's been an education and heaven knows I need more education. It's pretty Because cool. I'm a little bit remedial in terms of... Technology you know, or... Yeah. Well, and understanding how that communication works but it's fascinating to me um, you know how an adult on the spectrum how quick they are and how it speaks to me oh, yeah, and how much amazing. of a conversation we can have once they educate me about how they're going to talk to me it's it's really it's really, really cool, amazing it's actually, incredibly yeah. cool yeah. and 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 it creates so much hope oh yeah um, because amazing. they're they're able and the parents who are usually there with that individual talk about how much it opened up all of their worlds right. so that they could have the conversation. I was talking earlier about wanting to have that conversation with my child. This allows them to have that conversation with their child. And we have seen in the last year that there have been studies that have shown that with our younger kids, that they're taking time getting functional communication, that they're more likely to get to verbal speech having used something like that. It doesn't, I think a lot of times oh, yeah. parents think, oh, if I, if I do PECs, they won't talk. They won't, they'll never talk. And that, and we've, we see that 
science has shown us that that just isn't the case. Right, and thank you for bringing that up because that was part of the question. Yes. And I think it is important to say that, that yeah. often we use these iconic or nonverbal uh, formats to enhance or to get the child actually to start talking. So yeah. it sort of acts as a prompt. So don't think that teaching a nonverbal communication system will, will slow down the verbal. Uh, that's not true. All you have to do is to make sure that at some points uh, you pair the two and require the verbal. If you require the verbal, then the visual is just becomes a prompt. It's yeah. helping your child. Really remarkable. Good, good stuff. Okay, the next question we have. My daughter is sound sensitive. She can't bear the sound of the washing that the washing machine makes. I have to do laundry while she's at school, and now I'm going back to work. Help, or I may have no way to do laundry. You know, when we think about sometimes how we cope and how that informs the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. And then one thing changes. Right. You know, bless this mom because her child has been reacting to the washing machine. So what she found to do was, I'll do it while she's at school. Yeah. But now she's going to go to work, and her biggest fear oh. is, how am I going to be able to do laundry? It really brings home right. how, how debilitating these things can be if we don't deal with them. I know. And it's just for those of us who don't live with it day in and day out, it's, it's, and as many children as I've been with and lived with and grown, had them grow up in my care, it's a different experience when you think about things like this. Um, I have a couple of comments. The, the number one thing is buy some Bose headphones, first of all. Please buy some sound reduction or soundproof headphones. And the reason I say this is not because, you know, it's a simple solution. Because I'm, the reason I say it is because I'm worried that if your child is that reactive to, to the sound of the laundry machine, imagine how many other sounds are also bothering her. And it would be very, very life-changing for her to have the ability to take these headphones, put them on. You don't even have to have music attached to it. You just have them on and they, they cut down ambient noise. It is so uh, comforting to some of our kids to have that. So. Please do that. Um, that is really going to help her a lot. And they actually call those headphones noise canceling noise and canceling. sound ca sound canceling. Which, if you if you think about it, uh, just the idea of that for your child canceling some of the and sensory it's fabulous, it's is amazing, amazing yeah. how they work. And so that's not you know that's the very first thing. The second thing though is that you really this is goes into that deeper conversation of do we want to how far do we want to change our kids yeah. and so the issue is you know I always have this discussion with people when they say they're offended by our attempts to bring anyone out of autism and mm -hmm. it becomes offensive and why not just accept us the way we are and the, the what I'm about to say has to do with that because see this is a good scenario this is a good example of how it can be extremely uncomfortable for the person with autism as well as for family members when some very benign environmental factor has such a severe reaction causes such a severe reaction so laundry machine it's not like the loudest thing obviously it's you know not that noisy but it causes enough of a disruption to your child that you need to now modify your schedule in order for your child not to be disturbed by it and so on and so forth and that's the whole thing my, my point is to we can modify the environment to some extent in other words you're gonna get the Bose um, sound noise cancelling headphones and they will help um, but there are still going to be scenarios where your child may not have them, uh, when, like for instance in class, where your child, or it's unexpected, where you're in a car and there's like a, you know, a jackhammer or something. And you, you have to also, at the same time, while you're modifying the environment to fit the child, you also have to help the child figure out ways to cope with. Uh, what's in the natural environment. So, you know, after you've dealt with this and when you have a little bit more time or perhaps if your child has a behaviorist who's working with them, it would be important to shape the child's hearing and you can actually shape your hearing, believe it or not. Uh, you know, if you're used to listening to, let's say, a low volume of, of 
classical music mm -hmm. and once you have children you will gradually become shaped to a high volume of Metallica you know <laughs> you can you can your hearing yes. does get shaped so you can gradually expose your child to similar sounds and and uh, get them used to the sound of the washing machine so that it doesn't bother the child that much anymore. So fast and you know fast solution and then the more longer term solution would be to shape it up. Okay, really remarkable. I, uh, as you were talking, because last week we talked about a viewer who wrote in and said that they were offended by some of the language that we were yes, using yes. on the show, and and you had something that you you asked her some questions, and she did write back. Okay, you asked her specifically, um, are there things that you have difficulty with that you wish you had some help for? Are there things that you would like to improve on? And I, I don't want to share because um, we have had several email communications back and forth she and I and um, and some of it is is on the more personal side but I, I do want to share with you and to share with the audience that she wrote back and said that yes she does struggle with some things and that there are some things that she would like to do better and that uh, she also disclosed that not only was she diagnosed with autism but she has a young daughter who has now been diagnosed with autism and she has a cousin and they're all in different places on the spectrum and that yeah. she is able to see all the different areas um, and that each one of them needs support in different areas Definitely. Um, one of the things uh, that that she said she wishes that she had help with is uh, not having anyone to talk to mm. not knowing what to do about certain things and she most specifically said I cannot organize uh, I only go in a store once a month and I have a terrible time organizing things for the most part I really wish I could get my daughter some kind of friend but because it's hard for her to make a friend it is now hard for her daughter to have a friend so I, I wanted to share Ooh. that she and and she's been writing and we've been talking about different things um, um, but but I really appreciated her having the courage to say, hey, I'm offended when you say this. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then but, continuing the dialogue in yes. this way. Yeah, that's wonderful. We all have things that we would like to improve. Yes. All, all of us, we all do, or need help on. I Just real quickly, we, we're we out of time. Yeah. I just wanted to say that, you know, we do have a really fabulous set of programs for organization and planning. Um, if you are in correspondence, Shannon, please yes. guide her to the executive functioning yes. areas. The planning and organization stuff on there is pretty good. It really does help you, like going to the store and so on. There's some activities that you could just write down that would really help organize you. In general, writing down is a very good way to organize your thoughts. In terms of friends, the one quick thing I want to say, and we do have programs for friendship and um, you know, just increasing play and social activity and so on. But one of the things I want to say is don't worry about your daughter as much as, you know, things have changed a lot since you were a child and, and, and there, it's a different world and it's a world that is much more accepting of differences as a whole, whether they're ASD or other types of issues, uh, but also uh, as you can see, I mean, you have you. It's you and your daughter and your cousin and so on. And by the time your daughter is growing up, like over the next five or ten years, the way things are going right now, we all will have friends with on the ASD spectrum. We all will know people, and there will be different friendships. Their friendships now are different. Most of our kids' friendships are. I, I can see my twelve-year-old's friendships and are a hundred percent different than my eighteen-year-old's were six years ago. Um, the world is much more, you know, technical and on the phone and all that sort of stuff. So just giving you some view not to worry about your daughter and, um, I, you know, please reach out to us if we can help in any yes. way. Um, and we're and we're in talks, which yeah, is a great. good thing because I'm learning about what is offensive and why it's offensive and finding the right words. Because I never want to offend anybody. I don't think anybody who ever comes in the Absolutely. studio ever. Absolutely. That's never the intent. We want to never. hook you up with the resources. Um, and and if words that I use prevent that, then I want to stop that. So, um, but I appreciate it's all the things that you've back. been writing in, and and wonderful to hear and the honesty of her saying, yeah, there are things that I struggle with. Wonderful. Um, 
really remarkable. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so but much. Lovely I, day. I, I have a bunch more questions uh, that we'll save for next week. Although next week we're going to give you a little bit of time, Dr. Grampache, to talk specifically about some of the advances in autism. And uh, we had asked you what specifically you'd like to talk about, and you talked about wanting to share about games oh, and yes. using games as a as a piece of our therapy to really reinforce our kids and to give them another opportunity to learn which frees us up for a second i think it's an amazing amazing development in I'd the field of autism that'd be fun. yeah thanks for reminding me and i'll yes. um see if i can set up to them to bring and show some of our camp discovery stuff yes it'll be very very fun all right uh but thank you for being thank here with us much. and thank you for participating with us in our can campaign mm -hmm. uh and we're going to take a break and go to the a word after that we'll be back with let's talk autism with shannon and nancy nancy allspa jackson is going to be joining me for our can campaign and we're also going to have a special guest bonnie schlotke is going to be here with us talking about ballet specifically for kids on the autism spectrum and why you know you might have a daughter or a son and you thought oh we're just not going to be able to go do the ballet and bonnie's got some helpful helpful information about not only the fact that you can but why you should so that will be very exciting but first we're going to go to the a word this is the ongoing documentary being made here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders following a little boy, Jack Riley, who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. And this little boy is having remarkable things happening. We're joining the part in the series where the learning is taking place every single moment. So take a look. This is the A word. so he'll just say look at me instead of actually Hi. looking at you so during play I'll call his name or um, say look at me and he's doing really good I don't have to prompt him too many times he actually just spontaneously will look on his own which is a lot better today okay. I'll be help help what do you need help with <gasps> what do you need help with let's see that again eye contact what do you need help with? Look. Huh? Show me. What do you want? What do you want? Box. Box? Okay. okay. Say, I want box. Say, a box. Say I, I want box. Yeah, say, I want box. Yeah, box. Got it. Here you go. Here So we have a couple new programs um, that I'll show you. We have um, receptive commands, so that's just when we give him an instruction um, vocally, and he has to be able to perform that instruction just by um, being able to identify and comprehend receptively what it means. Um, and a lot of the actions that we're going to be doing, um, they're gross motor actions. And they're the same actions you've been doing in non um, NBI, so non vocal imitation. So they're, uh, so they'll be a look up, uh, they're very familiar, but um, it's just we're doing it receptively now instead of expressively. Do this! Good job! Ready? Do this! Yay! Very good! 
Stand up. That's good. Nice job. There's one sticker. Okay, ready? Clap hands. Oh, almost, but try again, okay? Try again. Ready? Clap hands. Oh, almost, kiddo. We're going to try again, okay? This is clap hands. Can you do it? Do this. That. Yeah. Okay, ready? Clap hands. Another thing, wait. Another thing we're working on is having him wait for things. And we're starting off with just two seconds. Just um, things like waiting for tangible items, like things that he really wants, or um, waiting before we go somewhere, or waiting before we open the door or something. Just so he learns that when we say wait, he just has to um, <coughs> stand there and wait for whatever amount of time. But as he gets better and better, we're gonna increase the increments of, um, I mean, Increase the duration of the time he has to wait. Wow. He went swimming yesterday for the first time in a while. How did that go? Went okay. Yeah. He, he was excited. He loved being in the water, we, but we, last he was a little cautious. We went in several times, and then, uh, uh, you know, A, we, we got diagnosed in, right. in the winter era, fall. But he hasn't been in since he got what? diagnosed. Did you do okay? Yeah. Well, he, she, I wasn't here, and she was with him. Oh, that's great. And, and yeah. Papa was with him. No. There too. Yeah. No, 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 no. Narcissist? I think he's trying to figure out. How, how can I see me? How can I see? <laughs> he's so funny. He'll do that. How so can I get a better look at me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to climb on your lap, Miss Suzanne. I hope you don't mind. I don't mind. <laughs> there are some days when I'm invisible and just a fixture in the room. Today is not one of them. The past few sessions, Jack Riley will for a moment notice me and become fascinated with a camera. He's been interested in looking through the viewfinder and figuring out the difference of what he sees in front of him and what the frame is showing him. It's like he's trying to figure out what kind of reflection is being shown to him. The way in which he looks at himself and others in the camera, to me, relates to eye contact. It seems easier through that buffer. Never interrupt a man in his crush. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, then we had, cool I yesterday. guess there were some bikini oh, girls over here he was flirting with. He went right up to the window and like looked right out. <laughs> set himself up. For <laughs> yeah, he did. I didn't see it, but I had it described well to me. Then the other girl came down to get her and he did one of these. He watched her walk by and I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, remember what he did to the waitress at Bodega? It uh, was all over her. Yeah, he wants, uh, we went to this uh, restaurant and our waitress came up. And he was, this was, I don't know, 10 months ago? Yeah. Eight, eight or 10 months ago. And he, he, uh, she sauntered off, you know, with her. Uh -huh. 
and he goes like this in his in his in his uh, stroller. He goes like this, <laughs> like the college kid, you know, watching her walk away. Right, Jack? <laughs> and he said, Dad, check it out. No, I'm just kidding. That was, that was too much. Did I go too far? Did I go too far? The fact that I was taking his pants off. <laughs> that, might, that might have been it. Dad. Hey. Hey, Sticky. Now, now you're climbing on her with the diaper. That's not good. That's not good. She didn't buy in for that. Uh, I, I took your game, didn't I? Yeah. I don't have any game now. No game, Dad. No pretty game, hard, Mom. Pretty hard to be cool with the diaper on. Okay, sillies. Come here. Hey. One, two, three. She's still filming. You can still watch. See? You want to see? There's some, some stuff you might not want to see. But. Okay, let's get the cracker off your chin. No, no kicking. No kicking. Don't kick your nope, sister. Nope, don't kick your sister. Yeah. I was going to say, Mom, really? Okay. <laughs> So I was telling him in the pool yesterday, don't kick your little sister. And I'm like, well, that's the first time of many that I'll tell him that. Before you before you go back to flirting. <laughs> Rule oh. number one. Yes. Definitely pants back off. No kicking. Hey, squirrel. Squirrel. Ow. Squirrel. <laughs> squirrel. Peppa pig. Daddy pig. <laughs> Mommy pig. My pig. Baby pig. Baby pig. Baby pig. Baby. Peppa pig. Baby. Baby. Good morning and welcome to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. I am Nancy. And I'm Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my fit. friend. Hello. Uh, Thrilled so, to be here with you this morning. Oh, uh, it's you know what? Last night I said to my husband, I'm just about ready for Autism Awareness Month to be over. <laughs> but I have you know, I took that back because in many ways, I wish every month was Autism yeah. Awareness Month. The attention that's been given to autism this month is fantastic. It is. And all the awareness, all yeah, I think the public is really getting educated. Yes. And I love that. So, And we had our fabulous Act Today for Military Families run in festival over the weekend. It was fabulous. Wasn't it amazing? Gem and I were there, and it was fabulous. You did a remarkable and job. And we raised a record amount of funds Yay! So for military families. So I haven't gotten the final number but I'll share those with you and I just was so proud of my staff and, for and so together. you should be and there you are look there's a picture oh it was so I great I took that picture that guy is a marine isn't he cute I'm telling you there were yeah. there those are my friends Tamara and Becca Wyatt's Warriors was the number one team we won there's Amy the incredible Amy from act today yes. she's my rock <laughs> and um, we were the number one fundraising team, but uh, we won a party. My child is standing in the middle of that group because he was getting ready to do this. Is the Where's kids Jen? run? Yeah, he's the standing kids there with a the, with a sort of tan hat in the middle. I see Jim. Yeah, and um, there, there he is. And he oh. that was his first time doing a run. He and did Nancy, great. I didn't know he was going to do it. And then he said, uh, "Mom, I want to do this." And he was so proud of his medal that he got that said he was a finisher. Oh, it was a big big deal. It was I'm just so a mile glad. I'm so that he glad. ran, but uh, it was. Good for and him. then we're going to be at the Autism Speaks Walk on Saturday. Yes. Wyatt's yes. coming, so yes. we and Jem are going to hang out. Be there. They're going to okay. walk together. Anyway, just some incredible things going on. Yes. And we, uh, for those of you that don't know, all month uh, we have been wearing can on our foreheads. <laughs> <laughs> and it, prepping for today. Yes, prepping because for today. today. We're asking you to put can on your hand or on your forehead or on your arm uh, or on your shirt or on your hat. Right. And it's not just so that we can all look ridiculous. Right. It is yeah. to bring awareness to coverage for autism now yes. for everybody and by coverage we mean coverage across the nation for the uh, blue standard of treatment applied behavioral analysis let's give us some t statistics Shannon yes. on why and 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 we start with ABA might be expensive because mm -hmm. a lot of people say we can't afford this but consider not treating with ABA is more expensive in 2007 a study by the Harvard School of Public Health estimated that lifelong cost of caring for an individual with autism 
was 3.2 million per capita. And that's for kids that do not get that early intervention because mm -hmm. studies have shown that almost half of the children who receive quality early intervention in the form of ABA will make such significant progress that they will require no or minimal services for the rest of their lives. Remarkable. Yes. ABA has been considered the gold standard in treating autism. It has been endorsed by the Surgeon General, the National Institutes of Health, and the Association for Science and Autism Research. The reason this is more important than ever is that one in 68 children now in the U.S. are estimated to be on the autism spectrum, and one in 42 boys has autism. Mandates have been passed in 36 states. 34 states have active mandates, with two others, Nebraska and Oregon, going into effect in 2015. But the reason we're doing CAN is because even with the mandates, there are many groups that are left out. Self-funded insurance plans are exempt from state insurance reforms, uh, the laws that have been passed. They are governed by federal law. And as there is no federal mandate, self-funded plans can choose not to cover autism therapies in states that have insurance for reform. Here in California, when the Healthy Families Insurance was phased out last year, those clients were shifted to Medi-Cal, which does not cover autism treatment. Those families lost their ABA services. So those, in essence, those families that need it the most, that cannot afford it, are not able to access it. Amazing. Uh, even when families have insurance coverage for, for autism treatment, many insurance carriers continue to practice deny and delay policies. I think some of us are familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Requiring families who have fought so hard for everything to continue to fight just to get the medically necessary services to which they are entitled. Expensive co-pays and deductibles are another problem because they're cost prohibitive for some families, and this is especially true for our military families. Which we is why we have the Act Today for military families campaign, one of the reasons that these people should not be having to fight two battles, one for their country and one to get services for their children with so autism. For all of these reasons, we stand in solidarity, all of us today, Nancy and I are joining you and standing in solidarity so that every family has the opportunity to get access to these really important services, coverage for autism now. Write it somewhere on your person right. or put it on your shirt, take a picture of it and email it to us email here it at to the us, show. Put it, post it on social media. Or put it on our Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. put it on everywhere and, uh, because we we have some news coverage that's going to be here in a little while and we want to get this to our legislators to let them know that we stand together on this we may not agree on everything no. in this community right but we stand together on this we do okay okay some other stories in the news uh, I found this really interesting this was a uh, and Jenny McCarthy does a column in in the Chicago newspaper and she uh, wrote a column on the gray area on vaccines and I have to say Jenny, uh, I'm in agreement with with the majority of what Jenny said. I think we both are. Uh, she said that um, for years that she, um, you know, has said, though, that she is not anti-vaccine. And then she says that she's repeatedly stated that she is, in fact, pro-vaccine, which I'd never thought of Jenny McCarthy as pro-vaccine. That was just a curious yeah. That was curious to me. Well, I had always heard her say that she was not anti-vaccine. Okay, but pro-vaccine. But I've never heard her say pro-vaccine. <laughs> okay. that's, that's a slightly different thing. But I had, I had always heard her say, you know, for some of our kids, we need to space out the vaccines. Yes. That I had heard. And, but and she really, in, the, in this article, says, I want to I want to go on the record. Yeah. This is what I think. People have misrepresented me. This is what I think. So we take that at face value. This is These are her opinions. Yeah, and she said that, you know, for her child, she asked for a schedule that would allow one shot per visit instead of the multiple shots they were and still are giving infants. And she just questioned whether children should have the, uh, the, the she said it's so black and white. You yes. either seem to fall in line with the 40 plus vaccines your doctor rec recommends or you're a whack job anti-vaxxer. And I agree that there's, there is a lot, a lot of, of gray area of in our community. So, and for many of us that do feel backed up by the research that environmental toxins play a role, we might be somewhat fearful when we have children that have a lot of environmental toxic buildup that perhaps a vaccine might add to that. And I think those parents deserve to be heard at least, right? Yeah. And, and she says here, I believe in the importance of a vaccine program and I believe that parents have the right to choose one poke per visit. I've never told anyone to 
not vaccinate? Should a child with the flu receive six vac vaccines in one doctor visit? Should a child with a compromised immune system be treated the same way as a robust, healthy child? Shouldn't a child with family history of vaccine rate, uh, a child with a family history of vaccine reactions have a different plan or at least have the right to ask questions. I will continue to say what I have always said, one size does not fit all. God help us all if gray is no longer an option. And I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that with the, uh, because I have a child with, with immune, a compromised immune system, and I have a child that did have a vaccine reaction. I, I don't say that I believe vaccines caused his autism, but I think more science needs to be done in well, this area. And I, of course, never believe in one size fits all. I've known that was a myth ever since I crossed the size 14 line. Okay. So, <laughs> there is no one size fits all. All right. So autism is a business opportunity. I'm really, really happy to see this, that um, a father of a 14-year-old son said he's fairly convinced that America is not really aware of the pending tsunami of burden that the current autistic rate will put on our workforce. And um, he's not alone. And they're seeing that a lot of companies now are seeing this as an opportunity. German software giant SAP wants to have 1% of its workforce be autistic by the year 2020. And of course, we have covered that here on the show before, but now yes. more and more companies are saying this is an opportunity. You were talking last night that you saw something on the nightly news. Yeah, on, on NBC World News Tonight, um, Brian Williams did a story on a dad, I think in Lakewood, Florida. I might have that wrong, but we'll look it up because we want to get him on the show. And he has a son with autism who's, I think, about 18. And he started looking down the line and saying, where, where is my son going to work? So he started a car wash company. And he employs only young people with autism. And then his neurotypical son, who's older than, than his brother, decided to go into this family venture as well. And he could have gotten a job. He's got a business degree. He could have gotten mm -hmm. a job anywhere. And now the father's thinking about expanding this other places. Wow. But he said, let me tell you, my kids aren't sitting there chatting on their cell phones and checking their texts. They're good. They're employees. working. They're good employees. They're good employees. That's a good so, reason why. Yeah. Uh, love, love, love that story. Now, there was also a new story that came out, research showing that there might be a link between male autism and the taking of SSRs uh, during pregnancy. Right. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, better known as SSRIs, and they are the most commonly described antidepressants to, to ease moderate to severe depression uh, because they, ha they have fewer side effects. Right. There's, there's now some researchers that have shown that uh, they study caution about taking these drugs because they're saying it's linked to a higher incidence of ASD and developmental delays in males. Yeah. So um, that's just something that we, I guess, another another uh, cautionary influence. It, yeah, it says this study provides further evidence that in some children, prenatal exposure to SSRIs may influence the risk for developing an autism spectrum disorder. It also highlights the challenge for women and their physicians to balance the risks versus benefits from taking these medications, given that a mother's underlying mental health conditions may also pose a risk to both herself and her child. Yes. It's a it's a difficult choice, it but is. we need to be informed and our doctors need to be informed right. when they're talking to us about these things. They say the strongest exposure effect is in the third trimester. Okay, good to know, good to know. Uh, and of course, with all those medications, you never wanna go off of them cold turkey, so make sure that you talk to your physician if you're pregnant and on one of these medications right. so that you know what to do. Right. Uh, and then you brought to my attention a lovely story about the benefits of dog ownership when you have a child who's on the autism spectrum. Yes. And you and I both participate in this. We do. <laughs> uh, Wyatt has never been without a dog in his life, ever. And it's a new thing for us, a relatively new thing. We've had our dog for two years. Yes. Uh, but we talked about it for the very longest time because yeah. we saw we lived in a neighborhood that was full of dogs and whenever there was a dog uh, around the therapist would always talk about how much better my son did he wanted to work for time with the dog oh yeah so uh there's there that's our dog miss daisy that's miss daisy that's her sleeping on the couch that she has re repeatedly eaten. oh there's and miss there's daisy with the photo family bombing. I, my bombing. husband called that a good picture of that's me, and a, I threatened to divorce him. That's a good photo bomb. All right, did we see my dogs? <laughs> I didn't see oh, the pictures okay. of your dogs. Emily, can you put up, uh, let's see, well, there's oh, Casey. There. She's so our cute. little rescue pup. 
and there's Hunter in my fur muff, so my pretty. faux fur muffler. <laughs> Very fun. Totally spoiled. And there's Wyatt reading to Hunter and Casey. We love that, reading yeah. time with the dogs. Yeah. He adores his dogs. And I think he's actually the boy that was raised by wolves, because as I said, he's, <laughs> he's never really been without a dog, at least three. We've always owned at least three. This is the least we've ever had, wow. too. And uh, every morning it's, Casey, Hunter, come give me kisses. And they come running and jump on the bed and you know it's mouse chaos but anyway there are um, lots of benefits to yes. having a dog it teaches responsibility um the the this, researchers say that it helps as a so social lubricant yes yeah it's uh, a so university of missouri people. researcher shannon that says it's stress relief companionship and opportunities for their children to learn responsibility now wyatt has to feed his dogs every morning mm -hmm. and he has to walk them several times a week it's on his chore list yeah well our dog doesn't uh, gem feeds her sometimes but <laughs> He couldn't possibly walk our dog. We have the rescue dog who turns into Cujo whenever okay. anybody else is around. <laughs> okay. so, so that's, you know, good plans to, to bring in a peaceful dog that was a social lubricant. But instead, what happens is we go someplace and Jem explains why people can't come close to us. Right. Well, <laughs> this researcher recommends that parents involve their children with autism when choosing a dog. Now, when we, uh, when one of our dogs passed away and we decided to get a new dog, uh, we went to the, the Petco rescue thing. Mm -hmm. And why? I wanted a little dog at that point and so we looked at chihuahuas well they all we took you know they said let's take them into a room see how they interact well yeah. the chihuahuas proceeded to nip him we put Casey in there and she attacked him with kisses so that was it right <laughs> then in <and> there <laughs> wonderful okay. and then we've got one more story about a new screening method which suggests that we can diagnose uh, children who are at risk for autism as early at as nine months that's great it's amazing it is absolutely amazing nine months to 12 months and this is coming to us from the Children's National Health System, uh, they've identified head circumference and head tilting reflex as two reliable biomarkers mm. in the identification of autism spectrum disorder. Uh, I. I really want to caution people, and it continues to say that the gold standard of screening tool is the MCHAT, uh, which which comes a little bit later on. It's important that that we have early detection, and I love the idea that they could say at nine to twelve months, look, you're at risk for it. But I really want to caution two things: first, that that people not think if they pass that nine month mark that they think to themselves oh good we, we're out of the woods right, we don't right. we're not we don't ever have to look again please don't think that and and also realize that if you were to get a diagnosis at nine to 12 months that you're at risk don't feel like that is uh, a black mark that can never be changed what we know is if you start working with a child early enough in some cases there have been places that the, the children never they they get them caught up so that mm -hmm. they never regress i know which, so that they may never actually get the autism diagnosis because they got that early help right now uh, let me just ask you about this m chat questionnaire because i remember it yes and it's it's a screening tool that is read and completed by parents and then interpreted by a healthcare provider. Uh, doesn't denial really come into play with that in chat? You know what they say? They say that they have factored that into the questions mm -hmm. um, so that they there is a median at which they can say, well, here's where a parent is exaggerating, here is where they're not, that there's a median in the middle. Mm. Um, I know as a parent, and, and we actually had a lengthy talk two weeks ago with Dr. Graham Pache about how they diagnose okay and how you know they take your child into the room and if you've sat through this we've been through it a couple of times and they take out that box of toys yes. yeah, the box of toys. and there's the, and it's got the doll with a little blanket right and it's got the little teacups and right. i was always offended because i would say we don't drink coffee right we don't drink tea right why are we judging whether our kids have autism by the little teapot yeah but they're looking at different things than that they look at i put a toy out how inquisitive is the child okay. and they factor that with that questionnaire that the parent and and somewhere in the middle after observing your child for two hours they have a good solid idea well I'm just wondering why you know I, I wonder how these errors take place then when my son at three was diagnosed with PDD NOS when he was moderately really more towards a severe end of autism I, I, I wonder how that happens quite frankly well and I and I suspect because it is 
there are parts of it that are arbitrary and if your child doesn't display in that period like maybe he just found that um, the person who was doing the test reinforcing enough mm -hmm. that that he did his absolute best mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that the the, pra the practitioner who was diagnosing said okay I see signs but I didn't see this one maybe right. he didn't ask the right thing or maybe he was writing when Wyatt did that thing there's there's room for error yeah the thing clearly. is clearly the thing is that the error is usually on the side of underdiagnosing, and we have the media who's saying that they're overdiagnosing. Well, my son was underdiagnosed. Yeah. I mean, without a doubt. And yeah. so that's why I get, you know, I, I get kind of on my soapbox when I hear this thing about let's not have needless anxiety by, by diagnosing a child with autism when they may be a slow learner. I yeah. say, what's the worst that can happen? They get ABA and they learn how to be great and compliant yeah. and anyway but also okay. it is uh, it is so rare if if not i mean it really is that unicorn thing that a child gets overdiagnosed that somebody will diagnose with autism when it isn't called for it's usually much more frequent that it happens the other way absolutely okay but we have a great guest today we i'm very excited about uh, seeing bonnie can and you I've pronounce been saying, last name shellacti okay. i was saying it incorrectly before so right. it's bonnie shellacti and she's going to be talking with us about ballet for all, all kids. kids and i found out about bonnie because I have uh, friends whose daughters and sons go to her program and they just love it. So when I started hearing about this great program, I said, we got to get this woman on the okay. show. Okay, so right. let's take a quick break and then we'll bring Bonnie in with right. us. Stick with Wonderful. us. When you find out you're having a boy, you always think like, oh, he's going to play football, he's going to do this and that. And then when he's diagnosed, all those things get washed away. It's like that piece that's always in the back of your mind, you know, where is he, what is he doing, is he safe? We really didn't know what we were dealing with. I wish that they could have directed me a little bit more and provided me some information. I was a young mom. I didn't know what it was like to raise a boy despite a boy with autism. Hundreds of thousands of families are not getting the help they need for their children with autism all around the country. ACT Today is determined to bridge the gap. These families really have to go through a lot to get a grant. The application process isn't easy. The records, the diagnosis proof, they're really battling for their kids. So when we can give them a grant, it is so wonderful to see that they succeed in getting that help for their children. Our founder, Dr. Doreen Grampache, is an amazing woman. And she is one of the world's foremost authority on behavior of children with autism. She's extremely knowledgeable and she oversees every single grant we give. She is part of that process. People may think of autism care and treatment as simply schooling or therapy, but you know, we provide important safety supports, things like fencing, for example. The whole family's living in fear of that child running out into traffic. I recently delivered an iPad to a little boy with some of the apps that are out there for children with autism. Miracles happen. I got the iPad from ACT. From ACT, What yeah. did it say? Can you repeat that, Dustin? I got the iPad from that. We have helped so many military families. And when I think of these brave families that are fighting two battles, one to protect our country and one for the right treatment and care for their children, it, it breaks my heart. And I think we have to do more as a nation to help them. There's not a day that doesn't go by that we don't think about it. Some people say, oh, he's normal. You don't see the battles that I see every single day. My husband does have to deploy, and when they get on that bus, that might be the last time that my kids ever see them. So I called, and then they informed me that he had received the grant, which was like a blessing from above. I was just like speechless. I just started to cry because, you know, without it, we would, we would have been lost. The ACT grant was a total miracle, and without that, they wouldn't be able to receive a service dog. So we're so appreciated what they've done for us as a family. Recently, ACT Today funded a program for military children with autism in San Diego, the Inclusion Films program, which is run by Joey Travolta and teaches uh, kids on the autism spectrum literal filmmaking skills. They learn how to make a movie. Are we ready? There you go, got it. 
Okay. Everything that goes into the process of making a film goes into everyday life. So they're learning life skills, they're learning to collaborate. It was really nice to know how much they were enjoying this camp. And they're with people who are supporting them and are making them feel great about themselves and their differences and their similarities. And I get two kids that are working together and apart and together and apart. So it's an interrelationship as well as a camp and a learning experience. It's so fulfilling when I get letters. One stands out for me, a, a boy who was 14 with Asperger's, and we gave him a grant to go to a drama camp. He wrote to us and said, Dear Act Today, thank you for letting me belong for the first time in my life. These kids are remarkable. You know, we underestimate them. They're so knowledgeable, they're so capable, and we can change the life of a family, which means changing the life of a community. Welcome back to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. Nancy and I are here with our wonderful guest, Bonnie Shalakti. Have I got that correct? Yep. And you are a wonderful individual who has extensive experience working with children and adults with all kinds of developmental mm -hmm. disabilities, including autism. Mm -hmm. And you're here today to talk to us about ballet for all kids. So first of all, what is that? Ballet for All Kids is a all-inclusive program that, like the name says, it teaches ballet to all children, and that includes children of all abilities and disabilities. And Ballet for All Kids is is my love. <laughs> so I actually came up with Ballet for All Kids. I've worked in the field of developmental disabilities for over 20 years, and I was um, rocking my daughter one night to sleep when she was two, and my daughter's t a typical child. But I was sitting there thinking, you know, if she had autism or cerebral palsy or something, where would I put her in ballet? And so I started to research it and realized there was nothing out there for kids with special needs to, to learn classical ballet. There's dance programs, but nothing that really would teach them the benefits because it would really teach them the technique right. of ballet. And so I developed a, a method that, that teaches children of, of all abilities ballet. And it's been really successful and really wonderful. And it's the Shalakti the method. The Shalakti method, yep. Uh, really wonderful. And, and tell us just briefly, why ballet? What is it about ballet that's so good? Well, ballet, personally, obviously from my own point of view, I love ballet. Mm -hmm. um, Were you, did you take ballet growing up? Yes, I took ballet, and ballet was so profoundly meaningful to me mm -hmm. as, a, as a child. Um, it put me through college on scholarship, mm -hmm. and on, on top of that, it just taught me so much poise and self-confidence, and it really taught me um, just, you know, self-discipline and, and focus and, and all of those things. And, and my belief is so many of our kids don't get get that, they're sort of written off in a way. Like, oh, they, they can't learn it, they, they can't do it, and, and therefore they can't get any of the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's really one of the reasons why, I obviously, I loved ballet, but ballet really, and any classical arts training, really gives so much back to, to, to children of, of, of all abilities. So I really wanted to, to devise a, a program that they could really gain good classical technique and good classical training. It's really remarkable. And tell folks how they can access, how they can get more information and find out about classes. Well, we have a website, which is um, balletforallkids.org, and you spell F-O-R. <laughs> um, and they, all of the information's on there about classes and about the method and, and everything about getting certified and, and, and our volunteer program, which we have a, a huge extensive volunteer program. So just look on the website. There's tons of information there. Okay. Well, we've got a piece of video that we're going to look at, and then when we come back, Nancy and I have a bunch of questions okay. about the individual things that help our kids on the spectrum okay. with ballet. But first, let's take a look Look at the video. Okay. As someone with an autistic spectrum disorder, you get a lot of confused feelings growing up and maturing but still not understanding the world around you. And they're lonely. These are lonely children. When I found out about Erica being autistic, I, I went to the now. I knew nothing about autism. I was completely ignorant about it. Just to stand next to someone and look them in the eye and talk to them without sounding awkward. That's like the hardest thing. Cognitively, they know what they're missing and they want friends. Many, many times, Brianna's come home from school and her comment is no friends. And that's really hard as a mom to watch. Dance was where I didn't need those skills. 
Dance was where I could be part of a group and ensemble and not seem awkward. As long as I had the steps and I had the rhythm, the music told me what to do. I didn't need the social skills that were required to hold a conversation. There's a whole new way of communicating. The message of this piece was just to make people aware that if a child looks different, acts different, behaves different, doesn't communicate well, it doesn't matter. The reality is they're a child just like your child. They want to live their lives just like anyone else. What can we do to make that life better? It's really, it can be hard to find the right therapy or teaching method, but, um, but once we do, it makes a huge difference. And that's why these services are so important because they do work. <laughs> with it makes you feel wanted it makes you feel loved by others beyond your family the journey he's taken is uh, is amazing just amazing and uh, we can really thank the class for a lot of that And we are back with Bonnie Schlachte, the creator of Ballet for All Kids. It's a 501c3 that is the only studio in the country and possibly the world that teaches, offers classical ballet training to kids with, regardless of their abilities or disabilities. Mm -hmm. And Bonnie, you are the creator of this. And you have a, you have a bit, not only a background in ballet, but a background in working with uh, developmentally disabled children and adults. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, my background, I really started off, um, you know, in this field. I sort of fell into the field, actually. Okay. I was waiting tables at a Friday's. I had a degree in psychology, and my dad said, you need to get a, you need to get a job in your field, right? <laughs> and we had an enclave there of folks that, that were developmentally disabled and rolling silverware. And I just went to the supervisor and said, can I have a job? <laughs> and he said, okay. And I literally just fell in love with this population, mm -hmm. just fell in love with, 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 uh, with them and literally have worked pretty much almost every job in this field from direct care staff to um, working in intermediate care facilities to working at, at being a supervisor at North LA Regional Center to being in executive, you know, um, executive positions in, at United Cerebral Palsy and, and some other places. Okay. So, um, yeah, so my background is pretty extensive and, and, and really I work now still as, as a, a director of development for a company called People's Care where we just developed lots of programs for folks. Great, and so what you did was you really took these two great loves, mm -hmm. your love of ballet mm -hmm. and your love of working with special needs individuals, yeah. and you combined them. I did. <laughs> and, and this, but what I love about this, you outlined for me and Shannon really how the, the Schlachty method uh, was developed and, and some of the things that it can enhance. So could you just tell us a little bit about like the visual learning, the auditory mm -hmm. learning, vestibular and emotional intelligence? Okay. Well, one of the things I realized when I was developing the program is, is that every child has an access point, okay? Every child has something that they're really good at. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to teach ballet, I really wanted to make sure that we were teaching to all of those different modalities of learning. So if somebody thinks in pictures and is a very visual learner, I wanted to make sure that I was teaching ballet in a visual way. If somebody was very auditory and really could, did things that way, I wanted to make sure I could teach that way. So when I developed the method, I really go through each of those modalities of learning and I throw everything in the kitchen sink <laughs> at these kids and see what sticks. And it's been really, um, just really amazing. So, so visually what we do is we have a DVD in which the entire class curriculum is on the DVD. So, and on the DVD, we do everything in pictures, as well as obviously explaining what's going on. Okay. So, let's say when you do a plie mm -hmm. in first position for those of us who have done ballet before, right. you're, when you plie, your knees make a perfect diamond shape. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I can say that, right, you're, and you guys can instantly get a picture of right. what, what I am. Right. Thinking. Kids obviously think in pictures, mm -hmm. I can say those same words and they're not going to be able to process that. Mm -hmm. So on the DVD, I have a huge diamond in front of my legs so that they can literally see everything that I'm saying, I actually do. So if in a tondu, which is brushing your foot along the floor, mm -hmm. I say, well, your your legs are broom, your knee is straight, and your 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 feet are the bristles, and you're brushing out ash. And so literally, 
I tie a broom to my, my leg and I do it for them so that way they can see what I'm talking about. Nice. Hear the words and, and again using that as a springboard of, all right, now I'm seeing it. Oh, now I can picture those words with what I'm seeing. Oh, I understand what she's talking about now. Okay. Um, so that's some of the visual. Obviously okay. I use visual schedules. Um, I color code squares on the floor so okay. everybody knows where their personal space is because a lot of our folks have issues with proprioceptive skills. Right. So they have squares on the floor so they can sort of internalize that space and they know where their space is and they know and that also teaches them stage directions of, mm -hmm. of where to go. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that way too when we start moving they sort of keep that distance, they internalize the squares right. <laughs> and okay. so that they're able to do that. So those are some of the visual things. Right. Um, all of the music was composed specifically for our program mm -hmm. um, by my sister. Wow. She's a classical pianist and she Great. composed all of the music. And Talented family. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, I'm very proud of her. Um, but so, all of the music is composed with that in mind. So all of the images that I'm using, we have music that corresponds with it, which also ties into the emotional intelligence. So there's one of it that we're we're learning stuff fine motor with hands, right? But it's you're a witch, so you're you're blasting things and you know you know doing all this kind of stuff. The music is very dun dun dun. Yeah. <laughs> it's very witchy. Yeah. Um, and then I tell the kids, make a really icky face. A lot of kids with autism can tell you what mean music is. Right. Uh -huh. They cannot tell you, but you show a picture of a mean face and they yeah. they can't distinguish it. Yeah. yeah. Here they are though, looking in the mirror, making a mean face, listening to mean music. So it helps, so them, it helps them identify just those real basic things of, oh, that face is angry. Mm -hmm. Oh, that face is happy. That face is surprised. So we use a lot of, 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 of that in the, in with the music and, and in with the, the visuals. So it's just a very, just sort of a well-rounded and really looks at the children holistically. It's really a, I mean, it's a beautifully thought out program. Yes. Now, I, as I mentioned, I have friends whose, whose children are in this program and they just rave about it. They mm -hmm. really do, Bonnie. And I know that a lot of our listeners, you know, because we, we have an international audience yeah. and they're going to want to know about this, mm -hmm. how they can access it. You have two locations in the Los Angeles area, which is Westlake and Encino, right. but you also are expanding. Tell yes. us about that. Right now we're expanding. We, we have some folks that, that we have a certification program. So if anybody's interested, obviously I can't teach ballet. So if you have a ballet background and are interested in teaching kids with special needs, they can go on my website and learn more about our certification program. Okay. Um, but currently we have um, some teachers that are being certified and have been certified that are going to start teaching in New York City and in San Diego. And that should start oh. happening in the fall. Okay. Will they be able to learn more about this on your website? Yes, they can go to my website. Website, learn more about certification. There's a just click on the sort of how, how do I become certified link and uh, it can give them okay. all the information. Okay, so you know, all of you parents out there listening, if you, if you think you have a budding Barishnikov and you'd like to explore this, <laughs> um, you know, please go on the website. And mm -hmm. I do want to point out that my, my friends um, emailed me a couple of weeks ago and she said that her daughter, we were not able to attend, but was actually doing a recital yes. at, at a very large uh, venue. Mm -hmm. And she was so excited. So you not only teach this, but the kids get to perform. Which I have to say is just so vitally important to what, what we do um, because it's just really amazing because the parents are very nervous. Very, They're more nervous than the kids of like, oh my gosh, my kid's going to get up there. What if they run off the stage and, yeah, and what, yeah. what happens? And what really, if the kids get up there and they just shine. Yeah. And what is so amazing is the love and the acceptance that they feel. I mean, you can feel it up on stage of they feel that. And, and it's just such a, an amazing thing. And then and it's so important also to our parents because here it is they just get to go to a ballet recital they're not going to therapy they're not going right. to anything yeah. they're just they're it's going to chance. ballet class or just going to a ballet recital and getting to be proud and and buy flowers for their kid and and do all of it's that it's a chance for them to feel like other parents get yeah, to, yeah. Yeah. Get to have up. a piece of I'm the tree. No, yeah. because yeah. honestly, it's one of the things parents talk about is when their child gets diagnosed, one of the first things that most parents think about is, well, I'm not going to be out there doing Little League and I'm not yeah. going to be at the ballet class. Yeah, I'll never see my daughter pirouette on yeah. stage. I'll never see my son hit a home run. And and that couldn't be further from the truth. And, further from the and truth. you had mentioned, we talked during one of the breaks about the fact that a lot of families try. They say, well, I'm going to do Little League or I'm going to do ballet. And mm -hmm. then a lot of families come to you after they have been 
ask to leave their valet and program. Oh, and shame. just totally. And it's it's really heartbreaking. You know, hear their kid. They watch Angelina Ballerina or the Barbie movies, yeah. and they're like, "Oh my gosh, I want to do that." Mm -hmm. You know, um, I had one one boy who who had seen The Nutcracker at his school and was like, "Oh my gosh, I so want to do that." And you know, they go to these typical classes, and and you know. The teachers, they try, but they really, they, they, don't, do, they don't They don't know. know how to cope yeah. with what's they going don't. on. They don't have the support system in place to be able to help these kids. Yeah. Um, and They don't have the education and, and the training And they don't have the education like and did. training, exactly. Okay. Well, and and the they get kicked out, unfortunately. Yeah. But but th this is different because of you. And you're a difference maker. And, <laughs> and we just applaud yes. people oh, like thank you. you. Remarkable. You know, thank you're you. really helping our children on the spectrum and our individuals on the spectrum have a better life. And you're difference maker in this oh, world well, and we applaud you for that. Thank absolutely. you. It's a joy. It's absolute. I love I, I love that I love my job. Okay. <laughs> so. All right. So Ballet for All Kids, we've given you the website. Please check it out. Mm -hmm. If you're interested, there is a certification program. If you're in the Los Angeles area, the New York area, and soon to be San Diego, um, I can't recommend it enough because I do have a, a, at least four friends whose daughters are in the mm -hmm. program that are just loving it and just blossoming. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, keep up that wonderful work. Oh, All right, we're going to take a short break and come back to close out the show. Stick, at, stick with us. Skills is an online program that provides assessment, curriculum, positive behavior support planning for challenging behavior and progress tracking, and it does this all in one place. The skills assessment and curriculum addresses eight areas of development, which even includes advanced higher level areas, such as executive functions and cognition, which pretty much makes skills the only ABA-based set of curricula for teaching more complex skills, things like problem solving, planning, self-management, perspective taking, and even inferring and predicting others' private events. Skills is a four-step system. Step one is to add the child to your account. Step two is to start assessment. The skills assessment is the only ABA-based assessment with psychometric research demonstrating the language subscale to have excellent reliability. Every area of human functioning and typical child development from infancy to adolescence was researched, making the skills assessment the most comprehensive of its kind in the world, and we're quite proud of that. Skills is easy to use. Simply click Start Assessment and begin answering questions, or simply type in a keyword find specific activities to assess, and add activities to treatment. Step three, choose activities. Once you've completed the assessment, Skills selects from a pool of 4,000 activities categorized by age, level, and skill type to provide you with exactly those activities each child needs. Start by choosing a curriculum, then a lesson, and finally an activity. Click the information icon to view prerequisites, ages in which targets develop, examples, and IEP goals. Click the video icon to watch a short video. Once you've identified an activity you want to teach, adding activities to treatment is a snap. Step four, start treatment. Here you can access customizable activity lesson details, add your own customized targets and exemplars, and edit an activity status such as introducing or mastering it. You can even print handouts such as worksheets, tracking forms, visual aids, and other materials. Skills also offers multiple progress charts, mapping curriculum progress, lesson progress, and cumulative number of activities and targets mastered over time. The Skills Language Curriculum is categorized by verbal behavior type so that users can identify progress for verbal operants, such as echoics, mans, tax, and interverbals. Skills is one of the only programs that provides the ability to write behavior intervention plans, or BIPs, for challenging behavior. With just a few clicks, the outline of the behavior intervention plan is written for you and ready to be printed and implemented. You can learn more about Skills today and get started by visiting us at www.skillsforautism.com or you can call us at 877-975-4559. Skills. Progress starts here. Welcome back to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. We had a couple of questions that came in during the show that I want to address. The first one, hello, my 12-year-old child with autism and ADHD is struggling with our move to a new home next week and a new school in two weeks. Mm. He's anxious all the time and his challenging behaviors, aggression, property destruction, and pica have all increased dramatically. Mm. We've always practiced coping skills, but he is escalated for the most of his day and does not respond to his verbal prompt. I'm exhausted 
interested. Thanks for your advice. Uh, we, we really want to say that a lot of this question I want to save for tomorrow when we have Dr. Jonathan Tarbox okay, what here. Time, what, what, when can this parent tune in? It will. He will be here at 11.15 tomorrow okay. Pacific time. So, so, Mom, please be watching tomorrow yeah. so we can specifically talk about this with Dr. Tarbox. Shannon can. Yes. Um, no, you're not alone. Yes. Um, this has happened to me and Wyatt's behaviors escalate, ex you know, when there is a change. He's getting ready to go to outdoor school with his least favorite therapist because this therapist is the best <laughs> and makes him stick to the hard line. And I am telling you, the anxiety in our house, including the pica, is woo through the roof. There you go. So I'm with you, babe. I'm with you. Um, you know, misery loves company. You're not alone. Um, no. I'm wondering if you do have an ABA program, if you can... Um, consult with that, you know, with your provider to see if they can bring in some extra help because oftentimes that can be, you know, an answer. Yeah. Uh, but definitely Dr. Tarbox tomorrow can address some of these things. Yeah. And I will just say to you, until Dr. Tarbox comes here, we've talked before about how our kids have different, sometimes we call them stims that help them to relax. Yes. I would ask you to go through in your mind, like, what are the things that are the least uh, intrusive, the least destructive, right? Because we don't want to, we don't want to allow pica to happen. We right. don't want to allow aggression to happen. Right. But Temple Grandin used to talk about spinning that metal plate on the right. end of her bed. And why it, my son splashes water. Right. And when he's really in, full of anxiety, he will go to the sink and splash. It drives my husband crazy, but I'm like, honey, that's his way to de-stress. But if you, yeah. And if you know that there's something stressful going on, you can, you can give them some more time and tell them exactly how much more time you're giving them to do that and say, you know, this is, this we're gonna I'm gonna allow you to get in there and do it with them yeah if, if the splash if let's say it's Wyatt and and you know you're moving going to a new school I would get in there and splash water mm -hmm. with them and say we're doing this together because you got to have some time to get that stress down but Dr. Tarbox will give us some and more there's advice one tomorrow. other thing I want to say is that when we're going through a period of like this sometimes we increase um our, our reward strategy. Yes. Uh, we let Wyatt work for things that he really wants with a yes. little bit more frequency with giving him those rewards. So Catch them a, doing something good and reward. If it's a DVD, if it's, it, and it'll take their mind off it. Like you might want to tell your son, I don't know whether he does chores, but you know, let's work for these chores and you'll get this reward. And it might take his mind off some of the more distressing change going on in the home. Okay. But we will talk about that with Dr. Tarbox tomorrow. Uh, then another person wrote in in uh, regards to our story about Jenny McCarthy and the article that she wrote they said wait when did Jenny change her mind <laughs> she was many TV shows to talk about her awful doctor made her son have autism I don't like her um, and of course we encourage everybody's opinions and whatever yes. you know individuals well, have to say remember that I, I the only thing I would say is that uh, now, in my life, I see that sometimes you say something and people take it in different ways. I don't I don't know. Right. But, um, well, it was a bit of a sh shock to me to read that she's pro-vaccine uh, when on Oprah she basically said that her son had vaccine-induced autism. That was just surprising to me because she was so strong about Evan regressing from vaccines. So that what she said, and nothing in the article seemed to me to be an about face, except that one statement, I am pro-vaccine, which I, I, I don't know whether there's pressure perhaps put on Jenny. You know, she's got a very big job now. She's on a major network. We know how major networks, and she writes quite frankly in her book about Barbara Walters uh, literally confronting her and saying, you know, I can't do an interview with you because you are anti-vaccine. Well, Barbara Walters is her boss now. I, I don't know how these things play in. I'm just bringing up some things that yeah. might have something to do with it. And, and I, this is the first time in a long time that she has specifically written something that can't be misconstrued. So I, at this point, I'm just saying I'm taking that at face value that she this is what she says. So my assumption is this is what she believes. I, and that's that's the way I'm taking it. Okay. Um, so but I, again, I don't know. And everybody has their their own opinions. Right. Uh, but I did want to take a second to talk again, talking about opinions um, about can. Because I really think that there are there's so many things that we could argue about and disagree about, that, about that are divisive. But this is that are divisive, and, yes. and everybody has their own opinions about things, right? And that's important. But 
I think this is an area. I think this is an area where we all can agree that we need coverage for autism now. I can't imagine anyone in the self-advocacy movement that um, you know <clears throat> believes that this is just a, a different form of neurodiversity uh, that can't agree that a child that needs to learn how to function in a neurotypical world cannot benefit from ABA. Absolutely. And I can't imagine anyone um, taking issue with this. And, and I just want to say too that. Uh, you know, there are so many other things that insurance covers and that the reason, if you really understand the reason why coverage was not available for ins insurance for autism for so many years was insurance companies said, well, we are not legally responsible for covering something that there's nothing you can do for it. And they would say about autism, there's nothing you can do for it. We haven't seen anything actually work. And of course, that is no longer false. true. It's completely <laughs> false. They have shown, <coughs> excuse me, time and time again, conclusively with science. Yes. Are that you, is, your, is your throat <clears> getting doing a frog. what? It, I had that happen on, on uh, <laughs> San Diego Live it's, last it's week. It's all that we get verklempt. So yeah, much emotion. I know. But um, but the truth is that there are hundreds now of scientific studies that back each other up that show that ABA is the gold standard of treatment for yes. autism and that progress is available for all of our kids. So now not I, just the ones so, who are profoundly affected. Yes. And, and so it's something we can stand together on. And I was wondering once told by a very well-known doctor in this field, I said, why can't we get any further along in our, in our fight to get more services, to get more jobs, to get more? And he said, until we reach a tipping point like the AIDS epidemic reached, where in the early days people were throwing human blood on other people, then there were those that were much more conservative. But until those communities came together, and I'm not liking, I'm not comparing autism to AIDS, so don't quote me on that. But until we can come together, all of these disparate units and say, we all believe that we can make the world a better place for those with ASD. And I can't imagine anybody that doesn't agree with that. And coverage for autism now, for ABA, for everyone is going to do that. So we ask you to participate with us. It's one single day. Uh, we ask you to put can somewhere. You can put it on your hand. You can put it on your wrist. My son has it on his arm. Uh, my husband has it across his wrist. We're wearing it on our forehead and I've got it on my hand. You guys have been sending in pictures. We want more. We want more. <clears throat> yeah, we want to get it out there. We're doing an interview this afternoon. We and are. going to cover this story. And, and we want to be able to send those pictures to some of our legislators yeah. to say this is important and this is important to all of us, not just some of us. So participate with us. Uh, then next week we're going to be back with a very exciting show that we're going to close out April in a really exciting way so you're not going to want to miss that. But don't forget today can. can. Coverage for autism now for and, everyone. And tomorrow we're going to have Dr. Jonathan Tarbox with us and we've got a dad who's going to be with us as well. It's going to be a very exciting day tomorrow. We'll right. be back uh, at 10 o'clock okay. Pacific time. That's one o'clock uh, New York time. And make sure you do the time zone wherever the math, wherever you are. Anyway, we're out of time. Uh, give your kiddos a hug from me. And give yourselves a hug from me. Bye-bye for now.